Welcome back everyone, it's Charlie. This is going to be my new Star Wars The Mandalorian Season 2 teaser video. They just dropped a bunch of new previews for Season 2. We got some first looks at the characters, so we'll break it all down. There's a whole bunch of Easter eggs, and they talked about what's going on in each of the episodes. If you're new to the channel, of course I'll be doing videos for all the episodes. Be sure to subscribe to get everything. We'll do a new Amazon giveaway. All you have to do to enter is be a subscriber and let me know what you're most hyped up about for Season 2. Starting with the big stuff first, I'll just number these as we go along through all the Easter eggs. Jon Favreau spent a lot of time referencing Empire Strikes Back when talking about the story of Season 2, just in terms of the way things move, the references that they're going for, because he revealed that Season 1 was mostly based on the first act, just the first act of Star Wars Episode 4 A New Hope. So they're basically moving into Empire Strikes Back territory in terms of what they're doing with the story. Really good example of that is the Boba Fett of it all. Boba Fett may have appeared for the first time in the Christmas special, but his first canonical appearance in a live action was Empire Strikes Back, the second movie. Now he's showing up in the second season of The Mandalorian, so it also implies that some of the themes and tone of Empire Strikes Back will influence the events of The Mandalorian Season 2 episodes. When you're also trying to theorycraft about how they're going to end Season 2, think about the way that they ended Empire Strikes Back. They also confirmed that the episodes themselves will feel more connected than they were during the Season 1 episodes. Each of the Season 1 episodes were mostly different bounties, like a series of one-off adventures with a very, very loose continuity tying them together as he was trying to protect Baby Yoda. There were only a few characters that appeared in multiple episodes as part of the overarching plot and only a few episodes themselves that were solely dedicated to that main plot. It just sounds like season two is going to be way more serialized. And they did say that the scope of the story gets so much bigger. Whereas in season one, they were mostly local to a couple planets. You didn't really see much from the remnants of the Empire, Moff Gideon's faction, or the New Republic. They said that season two will invoke a lot more characters and larger storytelling, more lore. That gets into the Ahsoka of it all, the Boba Fett, Moff Gideon, dealing with his backstory, the lore behind the Mandalorians and the Darksaber. But the first new scene here that they dropped is Mando, Cara Dune, and Grief Karga looking like they're in an Imperial facility or a ship just looking at the wall, the control panel behind them. Imperial gray, very sterile looking, very identifiable. It's hard to tell though if they're on a planet in a building in an Imperial facility or if they're on someone's ship, like if this is them on one of Moff Gideon's Imperial ships. Also, if you look at Grief Karga's color scheme here, this actually kind of reminds me of Anakin and Palpatine's clothes in Revenge of the Sith with the mixture of reds and blacks. He's not evil himself, but Carl Weathers did say we learned more about his backstory during Season 2. All we learned about him during Season 1 from Moff Gideon when he was reading off their rap sheets and their backstories was that he used to be an administrator, like a local magistrate that was disgraced living on Navarro before he started running the Bounty Hunters Guild. Of course, there are several previews and scenes of Mando and Baby Yoda that they dropped on what looks like Tatooine for the most part. This is them chilling out in town, looking like they're just waiting for someone. Baby Yoda sitting closer to eye level. The reason why they actually do that practically from the way that they film things is so that they can frame the shot with Mando and also have Baby Yoda in the scene without having to cut to a different shot of him standing at boot level on the ground. Like you're seeing both of their faces in the same shot without him having to pick him up and carry him around. But notice the posture. Pedro Pascal actually did say that he evolved the way that he performs the Mandalorian when he's underneath all that armor. Because a lot of it just involves his body language because you can't see his face, you can't see his mouth move, and usually most audiences look to that first when they're trying to get into a character. This is Cara Dune. It actually seems like it's on a different planet because the background architecture and color scheme are totally different. She seems like a lot of her time during season two is spent mostly around Navarro, now with Grief Karga, since she accepted his offer to become his enforcer in exchange for him helping clear her record with the New Republic. Because her whole thing was that she was still marked as a deserter when she joined them. She used to be a New Republic shock trooper, but then deserted. I can't tell if this is Grief Karga on a ship or still on Navarro. I'm assuming this is him just back on Navarro during a meeting with Mando or someone else. He didn't leave the planet during season one, so I don't know if that trend is going to continue into season two, but his activities running the Bounty Hunters Guild don't really call for him to fly all over the galaxy himself so much. This is the first look at Moff Gideon in season two. He seems like he's on the bridge of what is probably his Imperial Star Destroyer flagship. Giancarlo Esposito did talk a lot about what's going on with him during season two, so I'll get into that. He didn't say how big the force he commands is or how many ships he has in his fleet, but it's probably pretty decent size. You can just tell from the lights in the control bank in the background, it's just that signature look of an Imperial capital ship. The really cool thing he said about his storyline during season two is that he'd be going toe-to-toe -to -toe with Mando, like they would actually be having one-on-one -on -one fights with the Darksaber. 
He referred to their fights as iconic battles, but he also said that he'd be manipulating the Mando mentally. He said, and I'm quoting him, maybe there's an opportunity to get him to fight some battles for me. You may think I'm the villain. I'm trying to harness some energy and some powers for a path that could be best for all. You get to see him be somewhat diplomatic and more of a manipulator. So I think that's just making references to Emperor Palpatine trying to move chess pieces around a galactic board, manipulating people into doing things for him without realizing it. That just implies that he's going to try and get Mando to take care of some problems for him in the territory that he's trying to control in and around Navarro. He does refer to the Darksaber as a lightsaber. There are a lot of people I think that were confused about that. Maybe if you didn't watch the Clone Wars or you're not really up on Star Wars lore, the Darksaber really is just a different type of lightsaber that was created by an ancient Mandalorian, the very first Mandalorian to ever become a Jedi. New Jedi each make their own lightsabers as just part of the custom, but when it came time for this first Mandalorian Jedi to make his lightsaber, he used a different type of crystal, different type of architecture, so it has very different properties from other lightsabers, but it is itself just another different type of lightsaber. You don't actually have to be force sensitive to use it, but Moff Gideon did imply that he himself has a strange connection to the force, which I think just implies that he himself is force sensitive on some level, but was never trained as a Jedi. When he was talking about the resources that Moff Gideon has, he says, hint, hint, larger vehicle. I think he's just talking about an Imperial Star Destroyer because that would be the go-to thing an Imperial Moff would want in the remnants of the Empire. If you're trying to grasp for resources, that would be one of the first things that you would go for. This is just a different scene of Mando and Baby Yoda also on Tatooine. Notice him here in the little pouch on the back of the speeder. It seems like it has some tracking device attached to it, probably just as a security measure. Someone put a bell on that kid in case he runs off. The speeder bike is the same model of speeder bike that they were using during season one, episode five, and all the sand in the background, the color of the buildings. There's also the scene of the Tusken Raider on his Bantha, which should be a dead giveaway for Tatooine. This is all probably something to do with the Boba Fett storyline, because that's the last place that we saw him in episode five in that end credit scene with Ming-Na's body. There's no way of knowing which episodes these all come from, but I'm assuming they're from the earlier episodes since they probably wouldn't want to give away any big spoilers from where they go in the later episodes other than the general Moff Gideon battles that they get into probably towards the end of the season. This background landscape with all the volcanic rock makes most people think of Mustafar, but I think it's just meant to reference the volcanic landscape from Navarro at the end of last season. And this is just Mando and Baby Yoda looking like they're walking around on foot normally with him riding in that same pouch from the end of season one. During the Entertainment Weekly article, they confirm Rosario Dawson as Sokotano, Katie Sackhoff, Bo-Katan Kreese, Temerara Morrison as Boba Fett, Timothy Oliphant, and Michael Bain. I believe that Michael Bain is playing another older bounty hunter. I don't know if he's playing someone big from the Star Wars canon, though. And for those of you that are hoping that at some point Dave Filoni himself within the world of Star Wars and Lucasfilm will take a bigger supervisory role, John Favreau actually did say how critical Dave Filoni was to The Mandalorian Season 1 going so well. They said that when they were working on stories together, he was, as you would expect, the sort of lore keeper, the person who kept it being Star Wars. They also said that in addition to spending a lot of time talking about the movies, because obviously the series takes a lot of inspiration from the original trilogy, they also spent a lot of time talking about the Clone Wars when they were making the episodes. You could see some of that reflected in the Easter eggs, like you have the Death Watch Mandalorians from the Clone Wars showing up in all the Mandalorians flashbacks during the period that covers the Clone Wars. One of the other big things they said that has changed between season one and season two is just the way they use Baby Yoda in the episodes and practically the way they film him. They said that during season one, they just weren't sure how much to use him, but because everything went so well, now they're actually structuring a lot of the way that they film things around Baby Yoda. He's almost like the centerpiece, the real star of the show. But what's probably going to happen is in the next two weeks or so, they'll drop the official season two trailer. Of course, I'll do a video for that when it drops. There's also supposed to be the Dune trailer tomorrow. So as long as you have alerts enabled for my channel, you'll see all those videos when I post them. And there will be more Mandalorian bonus videos before season two episodes get here. The whole season is starting October 30th, so it's not that far away. While you wait for everything, click here for all my Mandalorian Season 2 and Season 1 episode videos, and click here for my new Chadwick Boseman Marvel Black Panther video. Thank you so much for watching. Everyone stay safe. I'll see you guys tonight.